Dr. Wadhams, we 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 hear all this conversation about cataclysmic, catastrophic, troublesome, uh, you know, uh, it, it's just this whole spectrum of adjectives that describe what arguably could be anything from a more violent than normal thunderstorm to the death of all life on Earth, right? But very rarely are these terms associated with actual imaginable outcomes. And so I think they just kind of fly over the heads of most people. They're, they're words that many scientists know exactly what they mean, but in general, they don't. Um, are we looking at levels at, at the current at the current warming that we're experiencing right now if we don't do something really substantial to make changes and i realize that there are positive changes and happening but not at the rate that everybody says needs to happen are we looking at something that is a challenge for us you know it's like the million farmers in syria who lost their farms and so they ended up in damascus which arguably led to that civil war uh and in fact i think you could argue that all across the the uh, the arab area that that whole arc you know is experiencing global warming in ways that are destructive um we know the bangladesh there's several hundred million now climate refugees coming out of south asia um these things for a wealthy nation like the united states uh, we would say oh, you know it's an annoyance but you know we used to have famines in ethiopia we've always had these disasters so is it in that category or is it more in the this is actually going to radically change the way you're you live your life but even if you live in the United States, you know, you think you're insulated from this, or is this like literally your grandchildren may not make it? I mean, where where are what are the realities here, and how do we assign probabilities to these? Well, it's it's a good question. How will things change? And uh, it's rather like dealing with a great big ball of string, and you're trying to find an end. Where do you start trying to untangle things? And I can think of a couple of ways in. The first would be if um, weather extremes are due to sea ice retreat and warming of the Arctic, as there's a lot of evidence that they are, then the weather extremes combined with uh, general warming are causing a real problem for food production in mid-northern latitudes, which is where most food is grown. So we're going to have food shortages getting worse and worse, even as the world's population is increasing. Now, that that has already had some major impacts for instance there's a lot of evidence that the arab spring was due to the fact partly to the fact that a lot of unemployed young people living in third world cities found that the cost of food was going way up and they couldn't afford to to, to eat um and that and they don't just lie down and die they revolt so you can have the the problem of of weather extremes could could lead to and social unrest and warfare. So you can have famine um, and warfare arising. You, don't, you, you can't predict what, 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 ha what unrest and what war warfare will happen, but something will, because uh, if you're inflicting very high food prices on poor people, they don't just sit there and take it. Uh, another way in is to think about, say, sea level rise. And if sea level rise goes at the rate that's predicted, which is now that it's going to be certainly a lot more than a metre this century, maybe two or three metres, that's going to make, within a few years or a few decades, a lot of cities uninhabitable, like Miami and a, a, a lot of and Venice. Uh, a lot of cities are most, in fact, of the leading world cities are seaports, and that means they're very vulnerable. So... As sea level rises, you can have a huge economic impact on the rich world because their their prized cities with their highest priced real estate being by the sea are going to have to be abandoned. And of course, the effect on the third world is much worse because you have countries like Bangladesh, which are very low lying, uh, very densely populated. People can't move away from the coast because there's nowhere to move to. So you can expect um, a lot of additional flooding and huge amounts of loss of life in in the third world and in the first world the rich world you can expect economic crisis due to major cities having to be abandoned and being unable to afford to to maintain the flood defenses which are needed so if you start with sea level rise you end up with economic problems in the in the first world and catastrophic 
losses in in the third world you start off with with um weather changes you end up with food a food crisis uh if you start off with um a methane outbreak then you're going to get a rapid warming and the impact of that will be on on everything related to both to food production and to water supply everything that you need to live so predicting how the catastrophe or how the problem will unfold is really difficult and i don't think people have done it they tend to think we're doomed and not think how is this going to work itself out what's going to happen first how can we try to minimize the impact by by devoting our attention to the the crisis that's going to hit first before before the the final the final one where everything goes sure well just to make it very local and use a couple of examples we're here in washington dc we're about 100 miles i think from the sea but there's a pretty big river the potomac that heads right out there i think we're at an elevation of around two to three hundred feet above sea level um i have a, a home in portland oregon which is near the the Columbia River, which is a couple hundred feet above sea level, it's a hundred miles out to the ocean. Is at that level, you know, are the inland cities uh, up upriver in the Mississippi? Are they going to? Is it going to be a situation as the sea levels rise, where where the brackish areas extend, you know, five miles, ten miles, thirty miles up into the rivers, whereas right now they might just be a, a mile or so. Or is it that the resistance to the flow of water coming down into the ocean because the ocean levels are higher is going to slow the flow of these rivers and cause them to get larger and overflow their banks more often? Mm. How does this all work? I'm, I'm not familiar with the fluid hydraulics of it all. Well, I think we, we don't, don't really know about, about rivers What's because it depends whether rainfall is going to increase or decrease as climate changes. And it means in some places it's going to increase and some going to decrease for for instance we there's a big loss of water from uh, the tibetan plateau because the the the, the gla- glaciers there and the ice is melting earlier and you're not getting water flowing through rivers there to irrigate um land at a slightly lower level same in bolivia so there's where you depend on snow melt in spring and there isn't the snow there to start with then you have less river flow and you have a, a big problem for growing crops. So some places the extra river flow is going to cause floods. Other places you're not going to have enough river flow to, to give you the irrigation you need. So it's impossible to generalise. Yes, you can't generalise. You have to look on look globally on a case, sort of case-by-case basis, which is, is not really being done very much. And everybody's too concerned with Armageddon rather than how it's going to unfold right or you know up to something short of that there was a lot of discussion around the year 2000 i I think it was when francis fukuyama's book uh the the end of history and the last man was published and um there were a number of books about kind of this is the end of civilization as we know it in a positive way like you know we're going to take the next leap this is the new you know the information age is the equivalent of the enlightenment of the 1700s um and uh, you know, some of it turned out to be just kind of fantastic thinking. Uh, you know, uh, some of it was used to justify the war in Iraq and Afghanistan, oddly enough. I mean, these were also the ne- neoconservative thinkers. If only we can make the whole world just like us, everything will be wonderful. Um, but they 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 dealt with civilizational changes. I think that you could argue that, you know, ISIS taking over a city in Iraq is a radical civilizational change. I mean, it's the destruction of a civilization. It's the destruction of a culture. They, they may get it back. There may be pieces coming back. But these are, we're talking fundamental, core, civilizational changes, the breakdown in, the, in Syria, for example. Mm. Are, are, are we looking at the destruction of what we call modern civilization worldwide? Well, I think we are looking at a breakdown in many places. Um, in fact, surprisingly, in places that we think of as, as being the most stable countries there are, like Britain and America, seem to be uh, uh, look having a kind of a mental breakdowns at the moment. But but there are the 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 break there's breakdowns going on because of these 
additional environmental pressures on 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 countries that are unable to with, withstand much of a change and um it will inevitably be a breakdown rather than a building up i think there was uh, einstein said that uh, he didn't know when he was asked about the third world war he said well he didn't know about that but he knows he knew that the fourth world war would be fought with bows and arrows that in other words any yeah. that, that everything will break down um and nothing you won't you won't this was his response to the atomic bomb yes mm -hmm. yeah so so to what extent is climate change an atomic bomb for us i mean how how inevitable how unstoppable how how rapid can we start to see things i mean i i remember just 10 years ago people were talking about ah you don't have to worry about this it's gonna be 2100 now people are going maybe 10 years from now it's like you know how rapidly are things going on well it is fast because everything is increasing exponentially even the amount of carbon dioxide we put into the atmosphere is increasing exponentially still despite mm. everything that that all the politicians have said about reducing carbon emissions we we don't even just have to reduce them we have to stop them because the carbon stays in the atmosphere so long and there's such a um a, a flywheel effect that the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere now will keep building up temperatures even if we stop emitting so we but we're stuck with exponential growth in carbon dioxide emissions exponential growth in nearly everything and those are things which as you say we don't notice until they hit us um that an exponential growth of anything doesn't look very much at first but then it builds up quite suddenly and and suddenly you're kind of fleeing for your life well, this is how cancers and infections work mm. you know you, you you get this this what looks like linear growth and then suddenly it goes exponential it it, it goes into that you know and, and that's that in in biology they refer to it as amplification you know once the bacteria starts amplifying like that the organism's doomed